Hello, and welcome to another episode of The Hump with Katie. I'm your host, Katie Thoreau. I'm so excited to bring you today's episode with the amazing bassist and vocalist, Nikki Parat. If you're new to The Hump, this is a series where I interview some of the world's greatest artists and performers and find out why are they so amazing, how did it happen, how did they become who they are today, and ultimately, what can we learn from them? We've already had some amazing guests on the show, like John Clayton, Larry Grenadier, Phoebe Russell, Joseph Conyers, David Allen Moore, Scott Colley, Christian McBride, and also some non-bassists like Walter Smith III, Kemp Paplowski, Justin Coughlin, and so many others. You can listen to these episodes and so many others on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, wherever you get podcasts, and also you can go watch them on YouTube. So go like, download, subscribe, leave a comment, and let me know who you want to hear from next. Before I bring you today's episode, I would love to thank our sponsors. And first up, we have Jams World. You guys know how much I absolutely love Jams World. I'm wearing it right now. And the reason why I love it is because the fabric is made from 100% spun crushed rayon and it's light and it keeps me cool while I'm playing. And it's totally unique artwork that's screen printed right onto the fabric. I always feel like I'm wearing a piece of art made just for me. Go to their website, jamsworld.com and use the promo code jazz15 and you'll get 15% off your entire purchase. Next up, I would love to thank Colstein String Shop. Colsteins have been family owned and operated since the 1940s, and they now have three incredible locations, two of which are on Long Island. And one of those is meant to be interactive. So you can take your family there and can, they can learn all about the string family. And they just opened up a new shop right in Columbus Circle in New York City. It's so beautiful. And if you know them, they have an amazing online shop. Go to colstein.com and use the promo code KD10 and you'll get 10% off your entire online purchase. All right, the time has come to bring you today's episode with the Australian native bassist and vocalist, Nikki Parat. If you've heard Nikki's music before, or you've seen her perform, you're aware of what an amazing bass player she is. And on top of it, she's a fantastic vocalist. And in getting to speak with her, I found out how she started playing and singing. And it's a really cool story, which involves the legendary guitarist and inventor, Les Paul. It was really a treat to catch up with Nikki. She's one of my favorite bass players because she really plays the bass and she digs in. She plays amazing bass lines and melodies and she's a wonderful vocalist and she has a crazy catalog of songs. I think she has over 20 records out as a leader. We talked a lot about her growing up in Australia and playing classical flute and piano and didn't even touch a bass till she was 15 and how she got to New York and everything in between. And on top of it, she's just one of the nicest and sweetest people that I've ever met. So I'm so excited for you to check out this episode. Without further ado, here's Nikki Parat. How are you doing? What are you up to these days? Well, um, I appreciate doing this. Thank you. Um, because we've never really had a chat because every every time we, we've been busy. when we Bass players other, don't talk to each other because you're no, always right. working, right? Yeah. So like you yeah. rarely go to see someone else play because that's just the life of a bass player. I mean, luckily. Right. That's right. And then you might get five minutes before you have to go to a gig or go somewhere or, you know. Um, so I'm, I'm thrilled to, to talk to you today and, um, oh, what's been happening? Um, I think, uh, you know, I think most musicians can relate to this. We're trying to make the most of it. You know, we really don't know exactly what's happening one day, the day to the next, whether gigs we have will happen, whether they cancel. So, um, I find it if I just keep creative doing a lot of things, a lot of different things besides music, uh, it keeps me feeling okay. You know what I mean? I, we, you know, my husband and I go for really long walks mm. <laughs> and, uh, you know, it helps, you know, especially now it's winter. It's, you know, it's a little more bleak outside up here in uh, Stanford. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. So you're supplementing with like things that you like to do. That's right. <laughs> That's right. I mean, um, you know, uh, yeah, it's reading, it's walking, it's watching good documentaries or films or something, you know, it's just keeping every, everything moving forward. You know what I mean? I think the, the worst thing is you can do is just stop and, and, and not, you know, keep creative. That's, that's the, the biggest thing. That's what uh, inspires me is just to be doing a lot of creative things in music and outside of music. Yeah. I, I once, someone told me in LA, um, you know, you should really work on like either, like other things in music, like not just writing music, but like doing little writing jobs and stuff. And I was like, I don't want to do that. But then it's like, oh, 
you know, times like this where it's like you have another skill that you could totally use and you're not hacking at it, but you're, it's something you can do and that, you know, you love it. Yeah. Right, right, right. Yeah, at the beginning of the pandemic, which um, feels a little, little similar to right now, actually, um, we were just, uh, we, were, we were at home, my stepson, my husband and I were at home and I was cooking a lot. And then we decided to do a cooking show. Just like oh, yeah, that. I was going to ask about so this. So it was, we did five episodes. Yeah, and we donated to World Central Kitchen and the ASPCA. And we did, we just did five uh, at the time. We'd love to do it again, actually. And um, it was cooking a dish and then playing a song. And mm -hmm. um, we love doing that. So, you know, there's, you know, it's it was just a time to stretch. And I still feel like we're in that. We're still in that kind of, oh, how can I stretch myself creatively? Yeah. To, to so that I'm not going crazy. Me. Yeah. 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 I did that once. It was like last year this time. I was uh, like on the brink of just going a little nutty. And <laughs> I like I like to cook too. So I like got a beta group together of my in-laws. I got people together who like can't cook and are terrible at it. So that, that was like my target audience. So my in-laws, uh, my dad likes to cook, but anyway, so it's like this niche group of people. And then instead of playing, I had a friend play piano, like, ah. like so like while we're like stirring something, like they would play. Um, Cause I, I have to check gone. that out. I, I didn't see that one. I have to check I it didn't, out. I didn't promote it or anything. It was my, ah, it was my okay. guinea pig group. And I was like, <laughs> I think um, I'll stick to, <laughs> to playing. Cause it was, I was, I was too annoyed. <laughs> now you're also vegan did you do vegan dishes or yeah it was it was just like yeah i am vegan i've been vegan for about five years so and it was it was that that too just kind of like okay. promote promoting my my interests where it's like you could eat delicious food and have it be vegan too yeah so but i'm not doing that anymore but anyways back to you nikki <laughs> um so yeah this is great like you said we've never gotten to talk and uh, get to know each other so I kind of really want to know I mean growing up in Australia I, I did as much research as I could about you but um what what is like your first musical memory of hearing music and being like having some sort of like moment where either you were attached to it or you had some emotional outcome from it and i don't even mean like uh you know like touching a bass but can you remember that moment of hearing music um it was early for me you know when i was my, i have an older sister who's a musician and um we both got into it very young i was about five when my parents got a piano and they got the an, an old beetle upright and they put it in the only space I had was really in my bedroom. So they put the upright in the bedroom and um, they were going to take piano lessons, but they were too busy. They were just, you know, working so hard. They didn't find the time. So they put us in, in lessons. And uh, it was just, for me, it was pretty immediate. I just, I, I, I just loved it from the beginning. Uh, we, we both grew up playing classical piano, um, my sister played clarinet. I played flute, classical flute. And um, uh, there's there's a there's a system of learning classical music in Australia. It's called the Australian Music Examinations Board. So you can get graded, you know, one, two, mm -hmm. three, four, all the way. So I did all I did all the way up to about grade seven on uh, flute and piano around that. You go to grade eight, and then you can <clears throat> you know, teach privately or do whatever you want, you know, with, with that classical training. It's really glad. I had that classical training because I learned how to read bass clef, mm. read treble. Um, I was never a great sight reader on piano, but I was I was good at practicing. I just it was an instant connection. And it was funny, I just went my first memory of like, this is really cool, was my dad was watching a Western on TV. And I came out of the bedroom and I started playing the melody on the flute. <laughs> And it was like, oh, wow, that's, that was that connection. Mm. It was like, that's the melody being played in the movie. And I'm playing on the flute. Anyway, it was, it was a moment for me. It was like, oh, this is fun. I can, I can, well, that's, I guess that's the first chance of improvising, you know, yeah. I mean, kind of 
figure out melodies. That's what improvising is really, right? You know? Mm -hmm. And uh, so, so that was the first time piano and flute. I did it all through, uh, you know, primary school and high school. And when I was a teenager, my sister had a band. She said, if you want to play in my band, you better play bass. I don't want a flute player. So they had one at school and it only had three strings on it. <laughs> but I brought it home and there was a, a bloke across the street and he said, well, you, you don't really need that fourth string. It was an E string. He said, you don't really need that. <laughs> and, uh, you know, you don't hear it anyway. That's right. He said, you don't need the, lot, the, the low string anyway. I thought, oh, that's a bit weird. And then when I'd go out and I'd see all these Sydney musicians, you know, they were also, as a teenager, a big inspiration, Sydney and Melbourne. But the Sydney musicians that I grew up around and watched, they'd come to my town and play, were phenomenal, just great mm -hmm. musicians. And so I learned from them. And, uh, yeah, I eventually got that fourth string. <laughs> I saw them play, I thought, I must yeah. need it. <laughs> Oh, that's awesome. And did you, <clears throat> when you got the bass, were you just playing in your sister's band or did you have another musical connection? Like you heard some music and, oh, okay, I want to play like that. Yeah, we played some popular music too. We played, you know, Beatles and everything. We like. But this was up, right? You were playing? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I didn't play any electric until I came to New York. Mm -hmm. And it was to become more versatile, to be able to do Broadway shows, to be mm -hmm. able to do weddings, club dates, anything, you know, to be able to work. Mm -hmm. uh, I taught myself basically electric bass. Mm -hmm. um, but at the time, no, it was upright. And then uh, after high school, uh, yeah, so we were playing on the street in our mm -hmm. little town. We were getting together once a week. We were going to band camps. Um, I was also playing piccolo in a band called the marching koalas i kid you <laughs> not i mean we were immersed we were just immersed in music growing up and once and, you got the bass were you still studying piano and flute or did that kind of yeah i did i did but um i got bitten by the jazz bug when i was about 15 so um i went to a jazz camp in sydney uh with my sister and some other musicians and uh I just decided to continue with bass. Mm. Um, I, th I think classical music is so hard to to get to that level. You know what I mean? And <laughs> mm -hmm. and of course, bass is hard too. But um, by then, I'd met a um, wonderful bass player called Craig Scott, and he was teaching bass at the Sydney Conservatorium. And I thought, yeah, I want to go there. I want to learn jazz bass. I want to play and, and it was a great time to move to Sydney because there were a lot of gigs in the late 80s mm -hmm. <laughs> so um I did a two-year jazz course and I just started gigging mm -hmm. it was fantastic and when you were I'm just asking like nerdy bass questions but right. when, when you got those lessons <laughs> did you were you getting into technique on the instrument or was it just kind of more learning about jazz and and making bass lines it was mostly jazz, but I did take some technical lessons because I was self-taught and I had some bad habits. Because you're someone, I ask that, because you're someone when I see you play, it's like your hand is so strong, you have amazing intonation and great sound. So it's, was that something that you kind of realized I need to work on that or did someone tell you, you know, help you out with that? Well, thank you. And I feel the same when I hear you. <laughs> so the, um, yeah, I definitely had, the Sydney Conservatorium had a great course. They had great teachers. And so I, I did some there. I did more study really when I came to New York. And I studied with Rufus Reed for a while. And he was a great teacher. And also um, Homer Mensch, who also hmm. taught Christian McBride around the same time. And so that's when I really started to hone in on trying to get better you know, chops, trying to get a better left hand, trying to handle the bow and be able to do better arco and, and be able to play better. He was a great teacher. Yeah. And I think sometimes too, when you're like, not, not necessarily older, but when you haven't been playing it from the very start and like, you're not like drilled into technique, okay, I have to do this just because someone's telling me. But when you kind of come to it at a point where it's like, I want to do this because I want to sound a certain way 
um, yeah, my teacher's helping me, but it, it's not like just like by rote, you know, okay, I'm just doing this. So. Well, also when you, when you, when you come to a city like New York, you know, and you're seeing all these really great bass players, you understand how important good technique really is. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, yeah. It's, I mean, especially as a bass player where you're expected to play many, many hours. You that's know. right. Yeah. Many yeah. choruses and not get tired. You know, that's the thing. Um, I, I sometimes overplay. And that's something I've tried to change in the pandemic. I thought, well, I have the time now. I can really work on not overusing my right hand, you know. Mm -hmm. And if I'm playing something fast, maybe I don't have to move around so much. Maybe I can play across the strings here, move up here, play across the strings. So I've been working on some new things in, in the pandemic, you know, and, and trying to practice things that, are, you know, when you're busy, you don't get to hone in. Mm -hmm on stuff that has never been easy mm -hmm. you know so it's back to bowing it's back to trying to play fast comfortably mm -hmm. easily so these are the, the things i've been really trying to hone in on the areas of my playing that uh, i haven't liked as much you mm -hmm. know and uh so that's been that's been one area that the pandemic has really helped me it's like i've had a little more time practice more tunes learn more tunes record different tunes you know mm -hmm. So, like we said in the beginning, you know, just how can I keep moving creatively and not watch the news? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, totally. Um, so when you're in Sydney, I I have yet to be to go to Australia, but everyone I know oh, who, wow. who's from there, it's like, of course they love it, but it just sounds amazing. Um, but so well, you like you, you live in LA, so you're gonna love yeah. Sydney. Similar. Oh, okay. Good. Um, <laughs> but like you said too, it's like, there was just so much playing opportunity for you. So when you were studying, were you kind of just like playing multiple nights of the week? Um, I got lucky in that respect. Not, um, like I said, the late eighties, there were these, there were clubs and there were pubs and the pubs on the weekend had fantastic musicians like Bob Bernard, like Tom Baker. Um, James Morrison was playing everywhere at the time. And so you didn't have to go far to go out and hear jazz. Mm -hmm. It was, it was a lot of places, a lot of pubs. Um, that's changed over time, but it was, um, it was a kind of heyday for Sydney, you mm -hmm. know, and uh, I was really glad to be there at that time. So it was studying in the, in the daytime and trying to do gigs at night and, uh, so, um, yeah, it was, a, it was a great time. There, there was work around. So I'm grateful for that. That was a good training ground. And I know you got an opportunity to, to study with Rufus Reed. Is, and is that what brought you to New York? I visited New York in 1991 um, because I, I got a, my first gig overseas, uh, even though I had played in Indonesia on a, on a, um, study abroad kind of Australian government program. I got a gig with more of a, like more of a traditional kind of jazz band at a place called Cavo, Cavo de la Hachette in Paris. Uh, and it was a week long gig. And uh, it was for dancers really, you mm. know. I don't know if you know this place, it's still going. Mm. Yeah, it's still going to this day. And so, went over it was you know it was basically you know saved money and went over it wasn't really like it paid much but went there and then um hung around europe for a little while but then when i went to new york i always felt like i have to come back to this place hmm. you know when you spend a couple of weeks three weeks in a city like that you're only scratching the surface of what's 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 there what's possible and so I went back to Sydney after that trip and I uh, applied for an Arts Council grant and I wrote a letter to Rufus Reed and he accepted me as a student. So I did every gig possible to save money between mm -hmm. the that three year period um, because I thought I just hadn't got New York out of my system. Mm -hmm. So that's why I wanted to come back. And when the Arts Council grant comes through, I, I just, okay, this <laughs> is my chance to do this, you know? Yeah. And I thought, Initially, I thought, well, I'll just go for six months. 
But I still found after six months that I just scratched the surface of, of what's possible to mm. do. And, and I just wanted to stay. <laughs> were, were you, you know, going out every night to clubs and jam sessions? What was it like for you? No, I wouldn't say every night because I also had to earn some money. It wasn't like I had enough to, you know, I didn't, the grant was enough to help to, to facilitate living in a expensive city. Yeah. Like New York. So I did, um, I worked in fashion for eight months at, at first. So that was three days a week. And I worked for this, uh, this fashion company that sold prints on paper to designers, uh, you know, in, in Midtown, 35th and Broadway, the, the fashion buildings. And so that was my job to book the appointments. And I worked alongside another Australian girl <laughs> and we took these prints up to the designers. And I mean, that was hard work. <laughs> mm -hmm. So, um, you know, they did offer me a gig full time. And I thought, well, I came to New York to be a musician. You know, I that's really what I came here for. So mm -hmm. I find that. But, um, you know, it was a very interesting world, the fashion world. <laughs> and just being yeah. sort of thrown in it un unintentionally, really. <laughs> yeah. But also probably having to have that job and work made yeah. what you were doing so much more worth it. Oh, absolutely. Yes. I had a nice little... So that was Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. And then Thursday, Friday, I played lunch times at the Angelica Film Center on Houston Street with George Common Jr. and his mother, Gloria, who's a beautiful organ and piano player. And so that was, that was fun. It was like, wow, this is, this is, this is pretty cool. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and what was it like studying with Rufus? Great teacher, great person. Um, you know, it, it really helped my confidence as well. You know what I mean? It's, it's, it's hard when you're younger and it's, you come to New York and it's like, well, just, you got to get in line. There's a lot of people in <laughs> ahead mm. of you. And it's uh, it's hard to gain the confidence you need to play in New York. I, mm. I found it beginning. So he was instrumental in that. Wonderful, warm person. I can't say enough good things about Rufus. And uh, he honed in on, like, like I'm trying to do now. In fact, it's funny, you know, you keep all those um, all those etudes that Homer Mensch gave me. I've kept them. Mm -hmm. So the times like this where, you know, gig cancellation or whatever, I can, I can pull it out, you know. Same with Rufus, I kept those notes. Mm -hmm. and, um, and I still remember a lot of the things that he told me and, and still practice a lot of the things he told me. Rufus has two really great books, if anyone's interested. Evolve, if you can find them, I hope you can. Evolving Bassist number one and two, both great. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think though he actually updated one of those recently. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, they're, they're really good. Um, and I, I mean, at this time, did you, was there any issue like the, of you being a female musician and let alone like a bass player? Um, or did you feel that at all? Yeah, I think, yeah. Yeah, sometimes. Um, I've always tried to ignore it. I, I know that I know that's probably the same, right? It's like you don't really, you know, you don't want to go there, you don't want to focus on that so much. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, it happened. It happened in Sydney. It happened a bit in New York. But um, I still, I, I, I've always felt fortunate that um, if they weren't going to hire me, they might. You know what I mean? There was yeah, always, do yeah. you know what I mean? I always felt like, well, and I did, I just kept gigging mm -hmm. no matter what, what it was. And, and there were just so many wonderful people like Bob Cranshaw and, and, and Rufus and John Clayton, you know, that was so encouraging that it, it made up for all of the rest of the noise. Mm -hmm. So I, I just found that, all right. I, I mean, I worked pretty, once I gave up that fashion gig, mm -hmm. I've worked pretty solid. Mm -hmm. 30, um, how many years, <laughs> 28, 26 years, I've, I lose track of time. But, uh, and, and I pivoted, you know, it's like I, when I met Bob Cranshaw, he said, you know, for the down, you know, in those quiet times, Broadway's a great gig. And then I met Mary, and I had been friends with Mary McSweeney, great mm -hmm. bass player, and I was stopping for her on, on Broadway. So 
um, it's a matter of making yourself available for different opportunities, you know, talk mm -hmm. to people, say, you know what I mean? And, and, and say, well, I think I could do that. Let me sit in a pit and see if I can try to start there or, or, or et cetera, you know, um, or create your own opportunities, which is something I admire about you is that you, you're a band leader at such a young age, which is really admirable. It took me quite a while. I mean, actually, during the Les Paul run and out of that, that I thought, well, I really want to lead my own gigs, but it took a long time for me. So I admire that you've just gotten in there and, and led gigs from a young age. It's, it's fantastic. I don't know if it was so smart, but uh... <laughs> no, but, but I think I really wanted to play with a lot of people as a side person before that. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. And also too, it's it's funny like talking about. I really don't like talking about like you know women like the female musician. Not that I don't like talking about it. I think with you, like I don't I haven't had really any experiences, and it's silly but also good that there are advocates. Like I would say, someone like Ken Poplowski is like yeah, sure, in incredible. Like he doesn't care. Yes, yeah, like you know, no, he's been very encouraging as well to me. You know, it's like, if you can do the gig, great. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, so that's, I'd love to talk about Rob Cranshaw too, and, and you know, playing in pits, because that's something that I don't think I could, you know, could do. So how, I I'm sure you, you <laughs> but I, I know you, so you knew Marianne McSweeney, but what did you, what was like the first night when you were playing a show? Uh, I think it was back in 1995. I did some off-Broadway before I started doing more on-Broadway stuff, you know, mm -hmm. um, and something for David Fink, you know, he also mm -hmm. gave, you know, he said, would you want to do Jekyll and Hyde? I said, sure, you know. Um, it's a different discipline. Yeah. All these different, you know, if you're playing electric bass in a, in a wedding band, it's a different discipline, you know, knowing those tunes. Mm-hmm. Um, you've still got to do the homework. You've got to do the hard work, no matter what, right? We know that, you know what I mean? It's like I, it's, the process is different. I'd sit in the pit and record the show from the pit. Mm -hmm. Get a copy of the music, go home, learn it. And either whoever had the chair would say, are you ready to come in? Or let us know when you're ready to come in, mm -hmm. you know? So, so that's how I did it. I'd learn it from, you know, um, from, you know, from listening to it from the pit and uh, make notes and some parts, you know, especially this quick changeovers from an acoustic bass to electric, mm -hmm. you kind of have to memorize those parts. You go, all right, one, two, three, four, pick up the electric. I've got two bars here, mm -hmm. you know, so there's certain parts that you really have to have down. Yeah, and, and for sure. people who who don't know, I mean, for the most part, there's only one bass player in a pit. That's right, most pits. Yeah, so most you're pits. doing all the bass parts, like you said, you know, acoustic and electric and being and playing many different styles. That's right, you're playing arco, you're playing pits. Um, there's some fun pits, fun conductors. Um, one of my favorite times actually subbing for Marianne was Avenue Q. I had a blast in that pit. That was one of my favorites because it was, you know, fun and, you know, everyone was having a good time there, you know. So there's different vibes, different pits, um, but it's a good experience. You get different jobs. It's, it's, it's a union gig and, you know, so all those things strengthen you, you know. Mm -hmm. And I, um, so I, uh, I don't discourage anyone from doing all kinds of gigs to, you know, for experience. Oh, yeah. Did you ever have that feeling like, uh, I kind of want to get back to, to the clubs. I want to get back to the I, festivals. I, or I often had that feeling. Mm -hmm. I always wanted to play jazz, mm -hmm. you know, and I also, I mean, I played all kinds of stuff for a while there, you know, wonder, and I enjoyed these gigs. I played with David Krakow, a wonderful clarinetist, and I enjoyed doing all of those gigs, but and my heart is, is, is with jazz. I think always has been, you know, classical music when I was younger and, and I still love classical, but it's, it's been with jazz for a long time. Mm -hmm. That's where I feel most at home. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, so how, 
how did you get to know Les Paul? How did that relationship happen? And was he really the one who told you to sing and yes. play bass? And were you singing before that, apart from the bass? No, I was not singing. Um, a little bit about Les, he was married to Mary Ford. Mary Ford was a wonderful guitar player and a wonderful singer. And they had an act and they, uh, they had TV shows. They, you know, uh, he's, a, he's a very eclectic, I learned a lot from Les because he was an inventor, mm -hmm. multi-track, solid body and pickups and other, other stuff. But that's the two big ones, solid body guitar and, uh, and multi-track recording. Wow, that's huge. Um, so I learned a lot. He was very curious, always curious about people, about things, you know, and, uh, but so I was in a group with, uh, some great guitar players and we were just jamming. We were just playing some gigs and jamming and, um, phenomenal players, David Spinoza and John Trope. And we were just doing gigs around the tri-state area here. And one day. Spinoza, who knew um, Les Paul, said, we have to sit in. We have to, we have to go down there to Iridium and sit in. I said, mm. I didn't mean to do that. So we went on stage. We played about three tunes. And Les looked at the three of us and said, you guys can sit down, but leave the girl up here. <laughs> and I got really nervous. <laughs> uh, but so far, so far I had known the tunes. You know, uh, mm -hmm. Les, or Les picked pretty standard, standard tunes. And if I didn't, the other wonderful guitar player, Lou Palo, he would help me out. He's like F7, F7, G, you know what I mean? He mm -hmm. would <laughs> help me out. on. So I finished the set. And then I subbed and then Les wanted me full time. And I was um, very grateful. Monday night gig in New York, packed every Monday. Mm -hmm. And just being, and the sit-ins and the people that would come down. I mean, I can't say enough great things about that gig. It was fun for yeah. 10 years, a lot of fun. And he he got me to sing <laughs> because I think he he liked that. He liked to have someone on stage that sang. And he had a very, I mean, he was married to Mary Ford and he, you know, he, he liked, he liked that. So I was in the middle of a bass solo one night and he said, you know, is that all you're going to do just play the bass and I was oh that's what I was hired to do Les yeah and he said uh do you do anything else I said well I sing at home everyone sings at home and he said let's hear it and um uh so I sang that night and then the lyrics I could remember you know and he tapped me on the shoulder as I was leaving stage and said leave that in so I had to sing every Monday from then on mm. to keep my gig and there was a lot of pressure in the beginning because I didn't like my voice at all. It, that's the hardest thing about singing, I think, is accepting your voice for what it is. It's exactly. not Ella, it's not Dinah Washington, it's not Peggy, it's not any of these things that we, we look up to. Mm -hmm. And it's taken me to really in the last few years that I'm like, okay, this is it. <laughs> I'm going to make this voice as best it can be. Mm -hmm. I'm going to try and breathe better. I'm going to try and sing more in pitch you know, all of those things. So, um, so it took a while to get comfortable on stage singing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. There, I like because we have to play as well. We have to do two things. It's... That's, that's enough, you know, for most people yes. for a lifetime. Yes. I like, there's a, the song Freddie Cole. I think, I think he wrote it for sure. Uh, I'm not my brother. I'm me. Ah, uh, you know? I've heard him do that. Because and because his voice sounds so much like Nat, of course, but he was his own, you know, musician. Um, totally. So for the Very singing, different. yeah. For the singing and playing, for you, was it was it natural, or, or were no. no, no? I had to pick really simple songs in the. I can't give you anything but love, baby. I had to pick. I had to go there, you know, songs with a limited range. Mm -hmm. <laughs> easy to remember, simple melodies. I had to really start there. Mm -hmm. And then eventually I got bold because I started recording. So not long after, um, I was asked to do a vocal recording for Venus Records in Japan. Mm -hmm. And so that was, that was tricky. 
I always, I don't know if you do this, I record the bass first and then sing over the bass part, sing over the band. That's how I always do my my recordings. So um, so it's not exactly live that way, but uh, so I started recording for Venus Records. So I got a lot more practice really quickly. Mm-hmm. Started doing a lot a lot of uh, vocal bass recordings and and got used to hearing myself back. I think that's the thing. Got used to hearing and hearing the things I wasn't doing as well. I'm like, oh, that's flat. I didn't realize I was running out of air and singing a little flat, you know, or <laughs> something, you know. Um, so that was that was actually really handy to be doing all those recordings because that really helped me develop repertoire, mm-hmm. voice, you know, voice, and and just get stronger, at, you know coming up to the front of the stage and and doing it (laughs) yeah I think maybe to did do you feel like it helps your bass playing yes yeah I do actually because um if I mean you're playing you're still playing in a rhythm section so you still have to lay it down Mm -hmm. um it's simple I mean when I'm singing depends on how well you know the song Mm-hmm. But I'm not playing overly complicated bass lines when I sing. Not really. I'm, I'm, Which, but I mean, that's what feels the best, you know? Yeah. And if, so, and if if you think about yourself accompanying another vocalist, you don't want yes. to play complicated over somebody because that gets in the way of the melody. That's right. That's right. So it's forced me to look at that, how to, you know, keep it simple, but get the get the idea across. Yes. Yes, and simple is the hardest thing to do. Um, I also saw that you studied with Ray Brown. I had one lesson with Ray. Which was probably worth a lifetime. It is. It was, yes. Uh, And that was back in Sydney. Um, He uh, was supposed to play golf that day. It was his day off. And I said, oh, that's okay, play golf, you know. And he said, how, how quickly can you be here? And I said, uh, <laughs> I can be there in 20 minutes. And so, um, yep, had a lesson then. And I, I wrote it all down. I wrote everything down because I found it recently. Mm. And, uh, and, um, he, and it, the most amazing thing was hearing Ray Brown play your bass. <laughs> right and he didn't like that I think I had two gut strings at the time two steel strings and he said no this is not working but it still sounded like Ray Brown it still sounded incredible mm-hmm. and that was a lesson that was a lesson it was like that he could sound that way on any bass blew, blew me away that just blew me away yeah I, I still think he's the only one I've, I mean I've only ever heard him in recording do that and on videos but he's the only one I've ever really really seen and heard him sound like himself yes it's crazy it is crazy yeah it is crazy um but uh yeah I'm, I'm glad I kept those notes because uh I was, I was reading through them the other day and it was all about simplicity like what we were just talking about mm-hmm um, he just had me playing Honeysuckle Rose and he just had me playing really simple two feel to start with. Mm-hmm. Walking and kept walking in. Um, and that's sort of the, the way I teach now, actually. You know what I mean? Starting with a really easy two feel, then maybe putting in a little extra stuff. And then walking just uh, with the, the drum genius apple, you know. Mm-hmm. So it's funny because I think that had a really big effect that one lesson it's amazing <laughs> i mean ray it, himself i could listen to him like in the late or like in the 50s and yeah. listen to him to the 80s 90s and up until he died in early 2000s what he played didn't really change like you know his melodic concept it he just kind of figured it out yeah exactly exactly he he and he could fit into any situation that's what that's what amazes me you know what i mean it's still something you know it's ray brown immediately mm-hmm. when you hear those lines and you hear that feel mm-hmm. you know so that's that's what amazed me he was so strong his whole life as a, as a player just yeah such a strong beat time feel everything <laughs> 
Well, speaking yeah. of sound, I mean, because I love your sound, uh, and I know it doesn't all come from the right hand, but what what was like a big inspiration for you for your sound? Um, Rufus's sound, you know what I mean? He, um, I used to cut my notes off a little shorter, and then I listened to him, and he'd get a really full sound, and and each beat was equal. Mm -hmm. So. Um, yeah, it's, uh, you know, I think it's something that grows the more you play. You get good at doing what you do a lot of, right? So the more you're playing and digging in, but not overly digging in, you mm -hmm. know, and, and have a bass that's comfortable and all that. Uh, I don't often take my bass on the road. So I feel like it's really, it's hard sometimes on a really bad instrument to get mm -hmm. the sound you want, you know? So um, I've, I've just cut sort of, tried some tricks on the road you know what i mean maybe then i have to play a little higher on the fingerboard because it's impossible it's just too high or something or i'll push the bridge down a little bit so i can get a little more attack mm. so i'll try to use whatever bass i have to feel like how i like <laughs> exactly and you know sometimes people will be like because i do that too if i have to i'm not going to kill myself you know if you're no. on a 30-day tour i'm not going to ruin no. the first day no, and some, some will be like, oh, you play with your hand really high. And I was like, well, I was getting the sound that I wanted and I'm not dying. Yeah, yeah that's right. Yeah, there's such a stigmatism, especially too, of like having like super high action. It's like, as long as you're getting the sound that you want, and right. we can hear you, that's fine. Depends also on the bass itself. It depends what strings you use. Gut strings can handle a higher action because they're much you know, they, they move around a lot more. Steel strings, you know, I, I feel like it doesn't, uh, you know. Um, and right now I have, I'm just using a travel base because my real base is on its way to Australia. Mm. It's waiting for a shipping container. <laughs> oh, okay. So, yeah, so, and there's a shortage of shipping containers in COVID. So uh, what I have now is a travel base and I'm playing it a lot so I can get used to it you know, mm -hmm. and, you know, that requires a slightly different setup to the Jusek, which speaks a little easier, mm -hmm. you know, so, uh, yeah, you have to be adaptable, you know, yeah. which, I think you have the sound in your head, don't you, you know what I mean, yeah, it's yeah. Like, you know, those early days transcribing four chambers lines and stuff, and Oscar Petter for bass lines, mm -hmm. and I just love, I still love that bass sound, that's yeah. a beautiful bass sound and I still it's still what I'm going for mm -hmm. yeah and it's fun like I mean I feel that way it's like I'm still never satisfied so it's like kind of gives you a reason to keep going Absolutely. But you're, you're totally you never, it's, it's all in here yeah the sound yeah yeah what were some I mean speaking of those people what were some like a, a couple recordings that just are like milestones for you Um, you know, when I was a teenager and my sister left home with all the cassette tapes, <laughs> I had round about midnight. Mm -hmm. Um, and funny enough, I had cheap career friends. Um, I listened to a lot of Miles Davis and Charlie Parker. Ch I had Bird at Massey Hall. I just had a few. That's all I had to listen to. Mm -hmm. So I, uh, I transcribed a lot of that, a lot of Paul Chambers, like I said, and all that, and kind of blue. Um, I'm trying to think of the Ray Brown um, with Oscar Peterson trio that I just absolutely love. Um, whew, it's the one, they're quite nice with quiet stars. It's, oh, we get requests. We get requests. <clears throat> I always come back to that. Always listen to that. Um, Oh, and then there's all those vocal albums I listen to a lot. I mean, yeah, there's so many. I don't even know where to start. But uh, that's good enough. Yeah, there's so many. Yeah, <laughs> there's a lot. You know, I listen to a lot of different music. You know, I like Brazilian. You know, mm -hmm. I like a lot of pop, some pop stuff. You know, and so I listen to a ton of different music. Yeah, you know? groove, groove is groove. Hearing, 
Right, exactly. When I'm gearing up for a gig, I'll hone in on some certain recordings that I, I play along with. I like to play along with recordings a lot. Mm-hmm. You know, there's an art, oh, there's also Art, Peeper, art Pepper Meets Rhythm section. I oh, play yeah. along with that. Love that re- that rhythm section. Yeah. Red Garland, Philly, Philly Joe and, and Paul Chambers, I think, the rhythm section. Mm-hmm. I love playing along with that. And um, for a good warm up, I'll, I'll, I'll practice along with um, uh, Dizzy Gillespie's Eternal Triangle, mm-hmm. Sunny Stitt and Sunny Rollins. I'll just put that on and it's 14 or 15 yeah, minutes. Yeah, that's a long track. Yeah. And it's such good practice. Keep going, keep going. Keep, you know mm-hmm. what I mean? Trying to go for consistent sound, consistent notes mm-hmm. and relaxation, you know? Yeah, so yeah. that's the stuff I'm practicing now is just playing along with records because I'm not playing enough live. I want to get the feeling of playing live, yeah. you know, because that's what I fell in love with was playing, playing live. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I know. I'm always telling people to, you know, make playlists and play along. And I was feeling a little mopey the other night. And I was like, oh, let me just do that. And then like two hours later, because I just had a playlist on shuffle. And it's just like, oh, man, this is so much fun, you know? Yeah, it's great. It's great. Yeah. And just challenging yourself because you're someone too, like, you know, a million songs, which is so inspiring. And and I don't think people, if they don't know, it's like there's jazz standards, but then you also yeah. know like traditional jazz and Dixie, like, you know, so many different kinds of songs where those have odd forms you know those yep, early, early right. music so yeah um yep. that's just inspiring like how much music you know um well i also <laughs> there was also times on those gigs you know on those traditional jazz parties that i didn't know the song and i was embarrassed mm-hmm. then i i learned the song you know what i mean so that Sometimes I got caught out not knowing certain repertoire, so I I learned it. And over time, yeah, over time, I uh, my confidence grew with different styles of jazz repertoire, modern to straight ahead, older stuff. Mm-hmm. You know? and and you know when it's when it's played well, I love it all. And it's really simple. You can just put on the um, uh, a lot of you know Hot Five, you know Louis Armstrong recordings. Mm-hmm. And you can be making dinner and stuff like that. And you can, and it goes, it, osmosis, it happens. You know what mm-hmm. I mean? You start to absorb some of those classic old recordings of Louis, you know? Yeah. And, um, so that's a great w- way to learn all that repertoire is, is, is start with Louis Armstrong and then branch out from there. But, uh, you know, I, I, I do like it all. When it's well played and swinging, I just love it all. I do. Yeah. 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 Oh, and you play with one of the most amazing piano players, Rosano Sportiello, too. And he, I mean, he knows every single song ever. He knows a lot of songs. Yes, he does. Because, uh, I mean, he was he was doing gigs very young. And, um, um, yeah, he's just, he's gigged all his life. And, he, you know, he loves all the old tunes. He just mm-hmm. loves them. And he plays them really well. Now, Rosano is someone that, you have to listen really closely to. And now we've played a lot together um, with the trio, with Rosano, Eddie Metz and myself. We've played a lot. Uh, we don't go up with a set list. Mm-hmm. It's whatever Rosano feels like playing. And then I'll sing some and then he plays some more. So it's very organic. It's nice. Mm-hmm. Um, he'll go into stride at some point and, and you've got to really listen with, with Rosano because he'll just break into stride. And you don't want your bass lines to clash too much. Yeah. So how do you how do you go about that? Now I can kind of hear where he's going because mm-hmm. we played a lot together. Um, sometimes it's just you're going to clash. You know, um, some piano players like you to play two when they go into stride, mm-hmm. and some like you to just keep walking. Rosanna wants you to just keep walking. Mm. So. I often double up notes, dong, dong, ding, 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 dong, dong. If they're going to jump, 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 yeah. you know, if they're playing a stride, you don't want to clash with them. So you, you try to <laughs> mm-hmm. just get out of the way. That's yeah. what I would say when it comes to stride piano is just get out of the way. Because I always support. just want to stop. They're really strong in support. Yeah. And don't play too loud because if there's two different bass lines loudly going, you know, coming at you, it's, it's unbalanced. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah, the more it's actually a really good practice to get to someone get together with someone who plays the older style so well. Mm-hmm. You know, because they they teach you good bass lines along the way. You know, you know yeah, it's nice. Mm-hmm. Um, I know you're also very heavy into like music education in especially in New York. Um, so was that a natural something naturally that came to you? Um, it's something that I haven't done a lot of until recently. Mm-hmm. Um, then I started doing these camps like Litchfield Jazz Camp and Hilton Head Jazz Camp. And, um, you know, and they gave me a lot of freedom to do whatever I wanted to do. So, you know, in Hilton Head, I started jazz choir. Mm-hmm. You know? And that grew every year. People wanted to be in the jazz choir. And we'd do everything. We'd sing Stevie Wonder to, you know, to standards and everything else in between. And that was a lot of fun. So um, my approach is I'm trying to, I'm trying to make learning an instrument fun because like, like we talked about, there are fundamentals that you have to do. And so recently I got with True Fire, wonderful, great organization that um, has a lot of incredible artists on their roster. And so I created 61 videos and a workshop for True Fire. And I did it, we did it, my husband and I did it in the pandemic. And uh, uh, I was just looking at some of them and I'm really proud of the hard work we did. Mm -hmm. Because sometimes if I wasn't happy, I scrapped it and started again. I was like, well, how do I teach it? So it's, it's really direct. Like they're really understanding what I'm going for because it's actually hard to teach what sometimes what we do on stage intuitively Mm -hmm. break it down into a a, a five minute video it's hard so i worked on that during the pandemic and i'm really glad with the outcome and glad to be on true fire um yeah it's it's available now it's you have a course on playing bass yes right right there's a there's a course and now we've just uh reviewed it so that there's also these five minute videos of which we did 61 during the pandemic so that's also going to be available on true fire so that's a great pra- platform. I like being there. And I did some, we all did some Zoom teaching. You know, um, you do Zoom, but you also do a lot of in-person teaching at the college, right? At the university. Yeah, but I love Zoom teaching. Yeah, it, it was challenging for me at first because it all depends on the connection, you, you yeah. know, the, the internet connection. Um, it was a challenge for me at first. And then I then I got into it. You know, and I did see improvement with the students, which really mm-hmm. was nice. Yeah, that's the most, uh, oh, it's so encouraging and so rewarding when someone, even in the lesson, you know, gets something, but it's like, it's more like three months later, it's like, you know, it's all happening at once. It's it's really, yes. I'm ha- we're so happy for the students when that happens. Yes, and I had one student that um, we, we started at the beginning of the pandemic, worked through uh, and she's a friend, she's a friend of mine. She lives in the neighborhood and she got into the new school. So I was really happy about hmm. that because she kept improving and we didn't even see each other in person. Yeah. But, uh, but we, we just kept on it and on it and, and she's, she's living in New York and doing great now. So that, that was a nice encouragement to know that, you know, that it can be done. The zoom teaching, you can get results. Yeah. So during, I mean, recently, like you've, you've been able to go out on the road a little bit. You know, we had, a, we had a good spurt. I had a good spurt in, in 21. Yeah. <laughs> it was like that last, that last part kind of. Well, really from May, you know, I had some lovely gigs with the Pittsburgh Symphony with Byron Stripling and um, all kinds of different gigs back at camp, even in Hilton mm-hmm. Head. Uh, the Jazz Corner has been good to me down there. The Jazz Corner in Hilton Head mm-hmm. was able to play there a few times. Went to Europe twice, and I don't. I'm, I'm looking back on that and I say, like, how were we able to do that? Omicron was here and, and in Europe as well, and fortunately was able to do a tour in October, a long like a month tour, mm-hmm. and um, and then like a two three weeks, ending up at Marion's with Rosano and Eddie mm-hmm. uh, in December. I think we just got it in there in the nick of time and then come back and um, last week played in Kiowa Island with a wonderful, wonderful drummer called uh, Quinton Baxter, who plays with Ranky Tanky. Mm-hmm. And uh, 
Kevin Bales, great piano player. There's good musicians all over the country. That's what I've found out the last 10 years, you know, traveling around mm. and doing camps. It's like, wow, there's great musicians everywhere. Yeah. All over the country, you know. Um, so I'm waiting and seeing, you know, I'm going to miss the jazz crews and, and the great hangs and, the, and listening to so much good music next week. Um, but uh, I understand, you yeah. know, why that had, didn't have, wasn't able to be to happen. Uh, I'm hoping for a gig with the San Angelo Symphony at the end of the month and also some gigs in Florida in February mm -hmm. um, with Rosano Sportiello and Eddie Pimetz, Um and also a tour in Europe in, uh, oh, in San Diego Jazz Party and also a tour in Europe in March, which will be five weeks. Ooh, nice. And, uh, and then May, my husband and I are moving to Australia, so we've got a lot on our plates if and i'm hoping they do i'm hoping mm -hmm. of course we hope and, and want them to happen and, and prepare for them um that's very key is to just keep preparing for the gigs even if you you know it's great to, to play and practice even if the gigs are yeah <laughs> yeah exactly it, it was i was doing a zoom lesson or a master class or something maybe it was the camp and one of the students i was talking about you know just practicing your scales with a metronome and he was like well, it's the pandemic, so I'm not using a metronome. And I was like, oh. oh. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Um, I don't only have just, I won't take up too much more of your time, but you also have like a ton of recorded music under your own name, along with right. other people. So, I mean, you're probably like, I feel like you're up to like 20 records. I have never counted them, but there's been two companies that have been really, really good to me really nice to me and that's venus records in japan but also arba's records with rachel domba mm -hmm. here she's a, a lovely person you know and she's been very very generous in recording a lot of musicians mm -hmm. so i'm um, very very grateful to rachel rachel domba um even did one uh last year actually i recorded at the end of uh end of 21 mm -hmm. in, end of 20 sorry that came out last year in april mm -hmm. so um yeah so that, that's been it's a nice opportunity because it, it it makes you it makes you a better arranger as well as a, a player and a singer you know yeah. so often oftentimes they tell me the tunes well particularly with the uh, with venus records they suggest tunes mm. sometimes i'll add to the suggestions and then it's however you want to do it music you know what kind of musicians do you want to play with what uh what arrangement what tempo what do you how do you want to do it so i enjoy that process because uh, you know i listen to a lot of different versions of a song mm -hmm. and then something will pique my interest oh that's a good tempo or oh that's a nice key oh it sounds good lower or you know, oh, this is a cool intro. I think I'll, I'll mess around. I'll do this intro, and you know what I mean. And mm -hmm. I think that's been a really good process for a long time. And and that's something. The more you do it, of course, you get more confident in your arrangements, and you know what to leave out. Some of my early arrangements were busy. Mm. Not not proud of that, but they just were. And then you work. You look at your work honestly, and you go, well, um, no, it doesn't need all of that. Mm. <laughs> yeah, sometimes it can get in the way of the song which was a, what right. I like about how you present music it's like it's about the song yes um i also learned to get the sheet music whenever possible mm -hmm. you know because sometimes i'd be learning from certain recordings and i would never be learning the melody quite right and sometimes someone would mention that um and so when I can get the sheet music that's that's great just to learn what the melody is i mean you can change it of course it's jazz Mm -hmm. but it's good to know what the 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 composer intended yeah you know at least try to sing most of that <laughs> mm -hmm. i know i always think like if you heard an orchestra like improvising like a well-known piece like you know like a beethoven symphony i'm like well it's not what he intended and you know right <laughs> right i hear what you're saying <laughs> um so yeah. what well that's, that's kind of interesting to have someone give like suggest the tunes for you and then all you have to do 
uh, well, not all you have to do. Okay, I have to present it in a certain way, and like even going down to like okay, tune list order and all that. So that's that's an interesting idea. So for Arbor's Records, is it? Do you choose the songs mostly? Yeah, for Arbor's, yes, yes. It's a completely it's apples to oranges with uh, with with the Venus Records. A lot of the songs that you're, not maybe all of them, but mm -hmm. there's at least half a dozen songs in the fourteen that were chosen. So I have to compliment those mm -hmm. the tunes i pick have to complement those others others with rachel it's been wonderful she says what would you like to do mm -hmm. and uh so that that's a nice very fortunate thing to be able to oh i'd like to try this you know, mm -hmm. you know? um so, do you have any anything that is there something where it's like i still want to do this i want to get this done i want to play with this person um I used to I used to think about that a lot. Um, ah, <laughs> it's funny. I don't think about that as much these days. I want to play with really good players who I like their company as well. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, and uh, fortunately, I get to do that most of the time. So that's that's really a treat. Um, you know, not at this point because. You know, as of May, we're, you know, we're changing our lives a bit. We're going in a bit of a different direction. You know, we're going to start a business of selling dog treats on the beach in Australia, you know. What? So, yeah. Yes, I know. So we, but also, you know, of course, musically, it'll change when we go to Australia. You know what I mean? What would I come back? For? You know what I mean? It's going to, everything's going to change. So right now, I just want to do as many of these gigs that are booked before then <laughs> as possible and it's a lot to think about moving moving back to you know moving countries is hard especially in COVID so there's a lot to think about and so I'm not really focused on uh, who else I'd, I've been really fortunate to play with so many just beautiful players and um, you know and and got to spend time with you know what I mean I used to drive Frank Westy gigs here in New York, mm -hmm. or, or Eddie Locke. I used to drive when these guys didn't have cars, so I pick them up and drive the gigs. Um, um, I'm trying to think, Joe Wilder, and all these just beautiful people, beautiful musicians. So I don't, I don't feel like there's like one person. I not right, not at the present time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, <laughs> I'm, I'm happy with all the gigs I'm doing. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's great. Um, I mean, before you go, what is Please tell me about the dog treat business. Um, you love dogs, right? I do. Do you have a dog or? I don't, but if I see a dog, I will pet it. I grew yeah, up with dogs. I grew up with English Mastiffs. Oh, beautiful, beautiful. Um, we just want to do this. I mean, we, we, we lost our dog during COVID, mm. you know, and um, we just, my husband and I, we, love being around dogs we just feel it'll be really uplifting we want to do a business together um we want to do treats i started doing a, a canine nutrition course and figuring out what is the best stuff to feed dogs and what can we do away with what are, what are active dogs what do old dogs need you mm. know and just kind of making them as healthy as possible but um with certain you know ailments in mind you know yeah. as well, you know treating treating them healthily in, oh, in, that's so cool. It'll be fun. Yeah. And um, there's a lot of markets in the area that we're going to be living in. So uh, it'll be fun. Have you tried making these yet? Um, I have recipes written down, but I haven't tried yet. I haven't quite. No, I'm not quite there. No, that's cool. I, I have a, I got a cat during the pandemic. Um, I think because... Oh. I always wanted to, I don't know why, but I always wanted to have a cat and, but my husband, Matt and I, you know, like we're always touring together and he was like, well, we can't have a cat because no one's going to yeah, watch it. Yeah, it's hard. It's hard when you're touring. And so, one, like I kept saying it during the pandemic and then it was almost like a dare, like, all right, go get a cat. So that I got a cat at the SPCA <laughs> and I was like, oh my God, what did I just do? Because uh, she's, she's like, you know, I wanted something that would just sit on your lap and she's the, yeah. she's, she's sassy she um and she's almost like a dog because there's like a lot of like that biting like that play biting and so she's more like a roommate 
Um, ah, that's sweet. But in, in, in the sense of snacks, I mean, she's big. She's a big cat. She's like 15 pounds, but she's not fat. But she does like, she only eats her one food. She doesn't, and she's not eating meat from us, but she loves crackers. And oh, she wow. Loves, and I don't think this is healthy for her, but she loves like things with rosemary and garlic and onion. Really? And anything that's crunchy. So Interesting. Yeah. She's got a catchy taste. Okay. Yeah. I, and, and she just discovered peanut butter, so. Oh, peanut butter, of course. Dogs too, they love peanut butter. Yeah, so and I'll, I, because that's how I grew up with dogs. I mean, it was just like base and dogs. So if I like was eating something, I'd take a bite and then give it to the dog. So that's how we are. Like I'm eating a waffle, I take a bite, and then she has some, and so. <laughs> yeah, well, I'm glad. I'm glad you got a rescue cat. You know, it changes oh, yeah. your life. Yeah. Yeah. She's yeah. she's sweet. She's um a little nutty, but she's fine. Um. <laughs> Okay, this was so wonderful, Nikki. Um, I know I always... I have a lot more questions for you, but so we'll, we'll rain check and, and chat another time. Yeah. Uh, more questions for you, but uh, how are you doing right now? <laughs> I'm, I kind of feel the same way as you. It kind of feels like we're at the beginning of how the pandemic felt. Um, I was... Yeah, are you having cancellations as well? Yeah, because I, I actually didn't, when the pandemic hit, um, I was like, okay, everything's, we're just going to say goodbye to that. And I didn't, um, cause I kind of knew a little bit about, I like science. So I knew about pandemics and I was like, this is going to be around for a while. I'm not going to book anything. So I didn't uh, actually book anything until 2022. Wow. Uh, I, I did a couple of things in 2021. Yep. It wasn't. So anyways, like this week I was, it was like, I was supposed to go out. Uh, but the next thing I hope to do is I'm supposed to go to Europe in April. So I, I hope that, that that comes through. But I hope so too. And I think it will. Yeah. I think um, it will. I've really enjoyed teaching. I've never taught so much before in my life. I, I knew I liked it before, but it just kind of like ignited this passion right. um, of right. teaching, which I really like. And then doing stuff like this. I, I originally wanted to do this on the road before the pandemic. Like if I was in Berlin, yeah. take a microphone yeah. and and interview the principal bassist or something right so and you're good at it so it's like yeah absolutely keep it going because um you know it's interesting i find it interesting but like you said like from the road it's like yeah if you can you know get a different perspective from someone you admire like that it's a great idea yeah my hope is too i really want to do it because i know ray brown would do this all the time I would like I want to if I'm in whatever European country take a lesson with with the best classical bassist. Yes. I, I think you. I've just been too timid. Yeah, it's also hard to get the time when you're on the road, but mm -hmm. it, it's a good yeah, if you can pull it off, it's a great idea. Yeah, I know cuz when you're booking a tour, you're like how can I fill up every single minute, you know. I know, it's tough. Yeah. It's, yeah, you you're tired. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah well nikki this was awesome um i know people can get your new course on true fire yes uh, and you've got a plethora of recorded music that people can find you and your website as well mm -hmm. and hopefully yeah. people will be seeing you in the next few months i hope so too i hope so too i i, I mean i don't take performing for granted at all especially now mm -hmm. i love being on stage and it's, you know, it's just sort of driven that home how much more, how, how fun it is when you see people again and, you know, and perform. I love it. <laughs> well, yeah, we could definitely see that when you're, when you're playing too. Um, all right. That's it from me, Nikki. I really appreciate you taking the time. Thank you very much for asking me. And it's, it's great to chat. It's good to see you again. <laughs> yeah, likewise. Enjoy LA. I'm jealous of the weather. It's horrible here. <laughs> I will say we had about a month of winter where it was in the low 60s and now it's blue it's like in the 70s so oh it's beautiful yeah. <laughs> i love it <laughs> yeah. all right awesome thank you nikki thank you so much all right bye take care